I often say that uh, my struggle against uh, neoliberalism began in the early 1970s when, uh, as I was one of that generation of British school children who um, had their school milk taken away by Margaret Thatcher when she was education secretary. Uh, and uh, ever since, really, I've been on this path of, uh, of extracting vengeance of one form or another. Uh, so this has been a long engagement for me with, uh, with neoliberalism. Uh, I, I want to reflect uh, today on some of the ways in which the term is used, uh, is used in the social sciences, is used politically, uh, what it's come to mean, um, and uh, what we might use it for. Um, so this is what I want to cover in, the, in 40 minutes or so. Uh, firstly, I'll say something about the ubiquity of neoliberalism and its terminology. Uh, then say something about how uh, the crisis has been a major moment, the 2008 crisis uh, has been a major moment for rethinking um, neoliberalism itself and uh, really spurred uh, new kinds of conversations about neoliberalism. And then the, the guts of what I want to talk about are uh, the misuses and uses of neoliberalism as an ex explanatory context and the work that we, uh, in the social sciences and humanities and elsewhere, um, uh, use it to, uh, to perform. So one of the things which uh, is striking about neoliberalism, I think, as a term, uh, if we look at its usage in the social science uh, literature, um, is it's a relatively new term, uh, even though it's been out uh, in the world uh, as an ideational project since the 1920s, as an, act, and an actually existing series of state projects since the 1970s. Uh, really, the conversation about neoliberalism in the in the scholarly journals and so on, in, in social sciences really only began um, after the mid-1990s. I characterize it as a post-globalization word. Uh, in a sense, it was the uh, more critical social sciences response to global only and, and the rise of globalization talk in the early 1990s was to insist on a political, that, that had political content. And I think neoliberalism became one of the ways in which uh, the left in the social sciences tried to uh, correct some of the claims about globalization. Subsequently, neoliberalism itself has become a kind of globalization word, a sort of uh, an explanation for everything, uh, and uh, may have repeated some of the sins of some of that early orthodox globalization talk. Um, there's another spike in the use of neoliberalism after 2000. It became a sort of millennial sort of signifier in the New Left Review and elsewhere. It was, there was quite a lot of discussion of it. Um, and then the big surge after 2008. Uh, I think there are a number of things that um, led to that. Uh, clearly, material circumstances caused a lot of people to ask questions about the deeper drivers of, uh, of, of, of the predominant form of capitalist ideology. Uh, There's also the, the fact that Foucault's uh, biopolitics book in English translation appeared at this same moment, uh, spurred a, a, we've heard a lot of uh, commentary on that at this conference. Uh, and a series of intellectual histories of neoliberalism from Philip Morofsky and others appeared at the same time as well. So I think there's a whole, there was a kind of a confluence of circumstances that has driven that latest surge. Um, I presume it'll keep heading upward, but, uh, but I guess we don't really know. But it's a relatively recent uh, term in many respects. Um, as I'm the, one of the few geographers here, I thought I should uh, show you some maps, uh, not very sophisticated ones. Uh, but if we were to imagine the, world, the neoliberal world circa 1980, it uh, looked a bit like that. You've got a series of national transformative projects in Chile, uh, New Zealand, uh, in Reagan, under Reagan and Thatcher in Britain and the United States. Uh, this was a time, uh, a kind of a moment in neoliberalism which Adam Tickell and I have characterized in some of our earlier work as a period of disarticulated uh, neoliberalism, a series of, of projects which had some kind of connections between them, but not uh, strongly. Uh, but this is also a moment when 40% of the world's GDP was being managed according to monetarist principles in the UK and the US, when they accounted for a big share of world GDP. So these were, in a sense, these were isolated transformative projects. On, in, a, in another sense, they had a much wider um, uh, salience. So if that's what it looked like in 1980, uh, this is what it looked like, I think, on the eve of the crisis, this sense that neoliberalism was everywhere, uh, absolutely pervasive in reach, uh, reaching every corner of the globe. 
Uh, I don't think anybody seriously claimed uh, that these, these were uniform experiences, uh, but many of these projects were quite closely interconnected and mutually referential by the, uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, then came the crisis, and uh, if you're to believe many accounts, um, this is what happened. Suddenly, neoliberalism was wiped off the map. It was pronounced uh, dead, uh, and it was the, declared that it was the cause of the Wall Street crash, and we would never go back to that, and the state was back, and that the social was back, and so on. Um, uh, and that brief moment gave way to this period, uh, where, again, neoliberalism seems to be absolutely everywhere. Larry Elliott in The Guardian uh, described uh, that pause as a, a sort of ideological service interruption that lasted six months, uh, from September uh, 2008 uh, to, to the spring of 2009. And then a sort of business as usual was rudely resumed, and in many respects some of the neoliberal projects under the sign of austerity have been more aggressive than their predecessors. Uh, so far from uh, being dead, it came back in a more uh, virulent form in many respects. So the question I want to ask today is what do we make of this? As a geographer, this isn't really quite an adequate uh, map of, uh, of a complex social phenomena. Uh, we need to get beyond, beneath these patterns. But I think that the, the fact of ubiquity is one of the things that we have to challenge, we have to struggle with if we're trying to use neoliberalism as any, in any kind of explanatory uh, sense. So, part two is um, neoliberalism after the crisis and the specific um, reformulation of neoliberalism in this, in this post-crisis period. As I mentioned, in the midst of the crisis itself, in the fall of 2008 uh, in particular, it suddenly became very popular to announce uh, that neoliberalism was dead. That was one of the spikes in the, uh, the use of the term. Uh, Naomi Klein declared it was dead. Uh, for her, a Berlin Wall-like moment, uh, the total collapse of an ideology. Joseph Stiglitz declared it was dead, also drew the analogy with the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Eric Hobsbawm drew the same analogy with the Berlin Wall. Uh, Sarkozy and many others uh, did the same kind of thing. So was it a Berlin Wall moment? We kind of know it wasn't now. Um, uh, actually, I didn't think it was at the time. Um, and uh, with work I was doing with Neil Brenner <coughs> and Nick Theodore, uh, we formulated three objections to the use of that Berlin Wall metaphor, that notion of a big bang total collapse, which I think sort of in the mirror says something about the nature of neoliberalism uh, itself. <clears throat> First, the notion that neoliberalism had collapsed in 2008, like the Berlin Wall did earlier, invokes a singular uh, a notion of a singular total collapse of a monolithic system. That, it seems to me and to us at the time, uh, meant a misreading of the nature of neoliberalization as a process, which has actually become entrenched in a whole series of other power centers and rule regimes and so on. It's, it's got a complex form of entrenchment, which means it's not likely to collapse in that singular kind of process because it doesn't exist in a singular form. Yes, it's interconnected, but that doesn't mean it's singular or monolithic. So don't expect it to collapse in that way. Secondly, and this is perhaps a more sobering uh, question, uh, we could ask ourselves what's on the other side of the wall uh, to neoliberalism. What was on the other side of the wall to Eastern European state socialism uh, circa 1989, of course, was a rapacious and expansive capitalism ready to jump the wall and to occupy that created ideological vacuum across Eastern Europe and elsewhere. But what's on the other side of the wall to neoliberalism today a series of relatively inchoate sources of opposition uh, which were unable to articulate a single story about an alternative to neoliberalism in the heat of the crisis. Uh, one, one of perhaps the more serious historical failures of the left in modern memory, you could say. So what was on the other side of the wall to neoliberalism, it turned out, was not very much, or at least not enough to move the needle away from a neoliberal-centric uh, uh, mode of governance. So in that sense, this was really very different to a Berlin Wall moment because there was not something waiting 
to fill the space. Thirdly, um, did or does a wall actually separate neoliberalism from its others? Um, in my book on uh, neoliberalism, I call this a mongrel mode of governance, uh, not just to be slightly rude about it, which I like to be, but um, uh, because it actually can only exist in mixed forms. There is no such thing, could never be such a thing, as a purely neoliberal system. It has to exist in parasitical relations with other systems. It has to live off other systems, and it usually gradually consumes those other systems. Uh, but we can't live in a purely neoliberal world. That's a utopian vision of Hayek and friends. We would, so I suppose the good news is we'll never get there. Uh, the bad news is that they'll continue to do enormous damage trying to push, it, push society in that direction. But if we can never live in a 100% neoliberal world, that means that neoliberalism always coexists with its others. It's always interdigitated uh, with its others. And so that means that neoliberalism takes a very different form if it's interdigitated with, uh, let's say, Western European um, social democracy or... Uh, or Chinese, or the Chinese Communist Party, or various Latin American regimes. It just isn't the same uh, animal in those mixes, even if it's got some kind of broader logic uh, to it. It's never singular, because it's always in these hybrid uh, forms. So it's not likely then to collapse in that singular uh, fashion. <clears throat> uh, the other point that we made in the midst of the crisis was that um, crisis conditions are the kinds of conditions in which neoliberalism tends to thrive. It was born in crisis, it's been subsequently remade through periods of crisis. It doesn't mean to say this it can happen indefinitely and forever, uh, but we heard that, had that quote from Milton Friedman earlier on, the spooky quote about the crisis being the, the, what they were waiting for. In a sense, the systemic crisis of Keynesian stagflation provided the context for neoliberal ideas to gain traction in the 1970s. Uh, they would have been, have been unlikely to gain traction without those conditions, I think. Um, but as a kind of crisis adaptive mode of governance, it's been able to continually reproduce itself through crises. And uh, in a sense, 2008 ended up being another object lesson in neoliberalism's capacity to uh, reproduce itself, renew itself under conditions of crisis. Uh, and actually to, to do so uh, with rather alarming effectiveness. So that, that, uh, this kind of analysis then underlines the notion that uh, Neil Smith and others talked about uh, at the time in 2008 and 2009, uh, that neoliberalism was in this kind of zombie uh, phase. Um, Marx already referred to this. Uh, this notion. In fact, not zombie metaphors, I could do a graph of those, uh, which suggests there's been something of a post-crisis boom in the use of that term. We've got books about zombie economics and all manner of things now. There's something about the zombie which seems to fit this, this moment. Uh, as Neil Smith had argued, neoliberalism may be dead, but it was also dominant after the crisis. It was, kind of, it was occupying uh, a sort of ideological vacuum of its own making. Uh, it had throttled most of its uh, actually existing alternatives, undermined the, the sources of opposition to itself, and it sort of occupied that ideological desert uh, afterwards as a kind of zombie. It's also a zombie. We know other things about zombies, of course. Um, they're mainly dead from the neck up, and I think we could say that's a characteristic of neoliberalism post-2008. Uh, actually, it's higher orders her higher mental orders may have been fatally damaged of, of moral leadership and intellectual leadership. That, that we could say, has, there's been some, some serious damage to the neoliberal brain. Uh, but the neoliberal body uh, continues uh, to thrash about and do enormous damage. You know, the one of the things we know about zombies, of course, is that they always repeat themselves. They do the same dumb thing over and over again, uh, and they head for the warm-blooded parts of society and try to throttle them to death. Uh, that probably also is a reasonable description of what neoliberalism has been doing uh, after the crisis, a kind of mindless uh, reanimation uh, where the limbs are moving uh, but the brain may be nearly dead. So neoliberalism then seems to have been reanimated by a kind of uh, muscle memory. Uh, it increasingly operates in this kind of technocratic uh, form. Um, 
uh, and associated with spasmodic uh, bursts of violence. We also know, yeah, more soberly, that it's strongly aligned with contemporary sources of political and economic and corporate power, um, uh, which most of those sources have been largely undisrupted by the crisis. In many ways, they've been fortified. So it's the marriage of neoliberalization and financialization has got even tighter post-crisis. And the fact it maps onto a lot of the interests of the powerful, of course, meant that the powerful were there ready to reanimate it um, straight after the crisis. <clears throat> so if that's the kind of story of the recent um, last, last few years of neoliberalism, uh, let me say something now about um, how we might use this term and what we might get it to signify. I hinted at the start um, that there was a danger uh, identified in quite a bit of the literature uh, that neoliberalism could have, yeah, maybe it was an alternative to that globalization explanation for everything in the early 1990s, but in some respects it's, it performs a similar function in many al analyses today as the first and ultimate cause of everything that's happening, or certainly the ultimate cause of everything that we don't like. Um, it was neoliberalism that did it. I'm reminded in the paper that I've written uh, associated with this presentation, um, I did some um, reminiscences about the Thatcher period in the 1980s in the UK, and those of you who were around uh, then will remember uh, that I blame Thatcher was our kind of favorite uh, political uh, response. Um, and we used to blame Thatcher for just about everything. And clearly, she had a lot to answer for. But there were many things that were happening there which had other causes as well. I don't think Thatcher was solely responsible, for example, for deindustrialization. She, she accelerated it, uh, but she wasn't the total cause of it. So, you know, I blame Thatcher may have been okay as a political slogan, uh, but it wasn't an actual total account of what was happening during the 1980s. In a sense, the Thatcher did it of 1980s has been replaced today with neoliberalism did it. If it's something that we don't like, we tend to tag it. Uh, to neoliberalism uh, and not always make the kind of connections and figure out what else was going on that might have been uh, complementary to the neoliberal project and so on. So I'm not saying that neoliberalism has no role here, but I think uh, we do need a rather finer analysis than just saying neoliberalism keeps doing it. Um, uh, and so this is one of the reasons why I think yeah, in the social science literature on neoliberalism, this has been a kind of ambivalence uh, about its use. So especially uh, a, a lot of very uh, perceptive uh, post-structuralist critics uh, have been arguing through the last decade uh, that neoliberalism had become an overblown uh, concept. It, it was associated with what they called um, inflationist uh, counts, uh, which tended to um, accelerate from specific circumstances to very large claims about global uh, ideology. And this kind of sceptical critique of the social science use of neoliberalism um, also made the point that its invocation as the first and ultimate uh, cause, as a hegemonic om omnipresence and so on, was effectively short-circuiting a, short a lot of analyses which required uh, more steps in the analysis than just to invoke neoliberalism as the explanation and uh, that, will, well, that will do. Um, and so I think there was a lot of... Um, uh, there was, many good points made in these, uh, these, these critiques of the, of the uses of neoliberalism. So this produces, produced a number of methodological reactions, uh, again, primarily uh, from post-structuralists, I think, who were was kind of skeptical of the term uh, and skeptical of its use uh, by people like me who were political economists who were invoking neoliberalism to refer to big processes and historical events and so on. If you're a bit squeamish about that kind of analysis, then you tend to be a bit squeamish about the use of neoliberalism, and so it got, in a lot of conferences in anthropology and, and, and elsewhere, there was a kind of eyeball role associated with mentions of neoliberalism in the mid-2000s. It's been somewhat recuperated, but I think those, those eye rolls say something about, oh, not neoliberalism again. Uh, we, we do need rather more specific and careful analyses, which I think we've, we've heard quite a bit about the last couple of days, uh, that pinpoint exactly what its effects are. So some of the methodological reactions we saw in the last uh, decade uh, were, among them, Iwa Ong's book, uh, Neoliberalism at Exception, on, on the table uh, out there. Uh, Iwa, uh, in a sense, 
positioned her reading of neoliberalism in Asia in contrast to a neoliberalism um, in North America. Uh, there's also a lot of use of neoliberalism in this post-structuralist uh, literature uh, where cases were held at arm's length from a capital M, capital N neoliberalism uh, and there was a sort of ambivalent distance between the case and this sort of offshore concept of neoliberalism which had to be kept at some, some distance. And so this yielded a whole series of uh, claims to exception to a neoliberal uh, pattern and, and many uh, many analysts tried were avoiding using the n-word altogether in the period leading up to the up to the crisis. However, people like Stephen Collier, uh, working in that tradition, uh, Foucauldian governmentality analysis and so on, uh, have recognised uh, post-crisis that we still need the term, even though it is kind of difficult uh, to work with. Um, we've called it in some of our work a rascal concept because it's kind of slips into this very broad usage, um, even though it, to us it seems to refer to something significant that requires uh, explanation. Stuart Hall, in his uh, recent writings on this, I think has captured uh, this sense of anxiety very well. He writes, the term neoliberal is not a satisfactory one. Intellectual critics say the term lumps together too many things to merit a single identity. It's reductive, sacrificing attention to internal complexities and geohistorical specificity. However, there are enough common features to warrant giving it a provisional conceptual identity. Furthermore, uh, naming neoliberalism is politically necessary to give resistance content and focus. He continues, hegemony is never a completed project. It's a process, not a state of being, which const has constantly to be worked on, maintained, renewed, revised, in ambition, depth, degree of break with the past, impact and common sense, neoliberalism does constitute a hegemonic project. And I think this kind of analysis I'd be very uh, sympathetic with. It seems to fit uh, at least my reading of how neoliberalization works as this rolling process of transformation which is never complete. Um, kind of like the zombie, keeps repeating certain kinds of strategies, but it does so in a world which is changing uh, not least in as a result of those strategies. So as neoliberalism has been drawn into the management of its own contradictions, it's also become increasingly uh, complex and mutated in, in form. And so that notion uh, from Stuart Hall, the sort of Gramscian notion of how hegemony, hegemony is produced in the, as this con continuous process, not as a top-down global imposition, but as a continuous process of rebuilding uh, uh, political uh, economic and social dominance and intellectual dominance, that seems to capture its, uh, how neoliberalism works to me. So I think in the debate up until uh, 2008 was kind of divided between those of us who were using the N-word, uh, sometimes with a capital N, uh, to signify an important historical process, uh, mainly in, uh, political economists, and those primarily post-structuralists who were sort of rather anxious about its kind of uh, overuse and oversignification, who preferred more particularistic um, analyses. So what I've drawn some distinction here is between these rather pervasive readings of neoliberalism and the rather more particularistic ones. Um, the pervasive reading uh, would, from David Harvey, Stephen Gill and, and, and company would see neoliberalism as a mode of regulation for financialized capitalism and regressive class redistribution pretty tightly yoked to those material conditions in economy and society, and indeed somewhat functional for their short-term reproduction. Uh, the more partic particularistic readings would see it as a diffuse form of governmentality associated with a range of post-social forms, subjectivities, and techniques. The pervasive analyses tend to be systematic, particularistic ones tend to be deconstructivist and rather keeping the notion of neoliberalism at arm's length uh, and looking at its exceptions as Iowa Ong, for example, would do. Um, the pervasive model is associated with a, you know, a template policy package of privatization and all the things we have come to know about neoliberalism. Uh, the particularistic analyses talk about bundles or assemblages of adaptive political technologies what's structural coherence on the one side is read as hybridized incoherence on the other. Global 
hegemony on the one side is contrasted with local contingencies, contextualized exceptions, and so on on the other. What well, from one side comes down as a top-down disciplinary regime is read on the other side through experience near ethnographic accounts, largely bottom-up reading of the um, of neoliberal subjectivities and so on. The pervasive accounts give us the big picture political economic histories of neoliberalism. Um, Iwa Ong and, and those kinds of analysts will talk about using low-flying uh, methodologies, often ethnographic in nature, uh, to again explore these really granulated forms. And finally, the pervasive analyses refer to kind of out there logics, rules of the game, and so on. Um, while, uh, while the more particularistic uh, analyses refer to in here specificities internal to particular places, institutions, bundles of subject subjectivities, and so on, uh, unstable forms of assemblage. And in lots of ways, I think the debate over neoliberalism and its use, at least prior to 2008, had kind of got locked into these two tracks. Um, when I was at Wisconsin in the early 2000s, I uh, ran a, a, a graduate student seminar uh, trying to have, develop a conversation across these, uh, with these two fields with a Foucauldian colleague. And at the end of it, we kind of decided that uh, it really wasn't going to work. I mean, they, they, we, we couldn't kind of get them into conversation. They kept kind of peeling apart again. I think we're kind of stuck in this rather, rather kind of binary um, uh, uh, a conversation for quite a long time. So I want to suggest some of the ways in which the kind of processual approach to neoliberalism uh, that I've been pursuing um, doesn't necessarily resolve all of those kind of tensions, uh, but at least tries to work in the space between um, the big picture accounts and the, those of, that really get into detailed specificities. So with Neil Brenner and Nick Theodore again, uh, we've been arguing recently that we need to think about uh, neoliberalization as a process, but also as one associated uh, with a variegated uh, form. It's a polymorphic uh, phenomenon. We have to understand it as polymorphic, uh, not to expect it to be kind of singular, as perhaps some of, the, um, uh, some of those pervasive analyses did, or, or again, to retreat into uh, specificities as some of the alternatives do, but to understand that uneven development is actually part of the story here. We have to figure out the rules of uneven development and, and figure out the nature of variegation to explain what's happening. Rather than go into this systematic versus deconstructionist position, um, ours is a more dialectical mode of analysis that seeks to, seeks to reconstruct understandings of neoliberalization through multiple cases across multiple sites. Rather than seeing this division between a template model or an endlessly adaptive set of technologies, um, our analyses have tended to focus on a series of transformative projects, and again, trying to understand neoliberalization across these cases, not from singular uh, readings. Rather than, again, get into the, con the argument about whether neoliberalism is, is coherent or incoherent, it seems to me that the challenge is to explain its contradictory reproduction. It never can exceed its contradictions. It can't take us to this neoliberal world. So the puzzle becomes, how is neoliberalism <coughs> reproduced through its own contradictions? And, and in the arguments that I'd made earlier about um, a, a rollback neoliberalism, which is about attacking its, uh, if you like, the alien forces and social collectivities and the welfare state. That's a key part of neoliberalism's dynamic. Um, it also has this rollout phase where it builds institutions, what we tend to call governance these days, to try to manage the contradictions of those earlier deregulations. And so it's got this dialectical quality, um, which is really about its central contradictions. <laughs> Um, I, I think it really is a kind of inter incoherent, contradictory project, but it's extremely dogged and persistent, and it's also been able to reproduce itself despite that kind of contradiction. So that seems to me is the challenge for explanations, to figure out reproduction of neoliberalism against the odds. It's not like it's uh, easily reproduced. I've mentioned this already, rather than 
go this global local binary, our uh, emphasis is on a cross-scalar analysis um, and taking account of an even development. Um, we tend to focus on frontal patterns of restructuring rather than uh, simple top-down or top-bottom-up uh, models and conjunctural analyses uh, complementary with that. So one of the reasons that we'd tell me see I'm good. One of the reasons that we'd argue the, the need to do this um, is the need to think across um, the different neoliberal formations if we're to understand neoliberalism in its complex, unevenly developed, partially globalized form. It has to be understood across conjunctions, not from a singular conjuncture. So Iwa Ong's formulation of neoliberalism as exception finds it to be exceptional in Asia, but apparently normal in the United States. I think that is a complete misreading of neoliberalism to suggest that it's naturally at home in the United States and it's foreign when it's somewhere else. Even at home, neoliberalism in the US is in various complex marriages with neoconservatism, um, with all sorts of other political formations. It's not naturally existing there, that's an absurd construction. But it only exists kind of by implication in Iowa's analysis. She's mainly concerned with, with Asia, and I'd defer to a reading of the specificities of that. So if we're to explain neoliberalism, we need to account for it in North America and in Asia, not to say, well, one's an exception and one is normal. So again, this is the need to think about neoliberalism in the context of an even development. Um, this is the geographer's plea, I suppose, that we understand it in these multiple sites, uh, not to read from a single site. There are other per uh, persuasive uh, and also controversial analyses that tend to do that singular reading. Loïc Vacant tends to do it in reading the American prison system as some kind of um, institutional uh, point to which all neoliberal systems are trending. Uh, I think that's also a kind of error. So, I'm nearly at the, uh, the end of what I want to say, and I'll, I'll be interested to if you've got any strength left um, uh, to continue the conversation in, in questions. So uh, my take on neoliberalization then is that it's got this um, contradictory character which is central to understanding how it works. It's, to use Polanyi's phrase, a stark uh, utopia, um, because we can't arrive at the neoliberal destination, it produces a kind of directional politics. It's not destinational politics, it's directional. Neoliberals, whenever they wake up in the morning, they know what they need to do. Um, I've done a lot of work with think tanks in Washington, D.C., and so on. What these guys have is certainty about uh, what to do. They've got their guidebook. Um, they know the world's more complex than that, but they always know which direction they want to push in. So it is directional, even though we'll never get to the destination uh, which Hayek envisaged. You know, they claim to see it from the mountaintop in Mont Pelerin, uh, but that we really will never get to that world of perfect freedoms and wonderfully working markets and that kind of thing. We all live in a complex, uh, messy world. So we won't get there, uh, but they are pushing in that direction. That's a characteristic of neoliberalism. And that means that it organizes it as a frontal project. There's a, if you like, there's a kind of guidebook uh, for what to do if you're a neoliberal. Uh, you, can kind of, you know which direction in which to push. So that tends to organize their projects in certain ways. <clears throat> I've mentioned already um, that, we, that neoliberalism will never kind of be this dominant form. Therefore, we need to understand it in a whole series of sort of unhappy marriages or discrepant uh, form formations. There's no simple trajectory from uh, or towards purity. We, won't, we don't live in a more ne neoliberal world now than a few years ago. Uh, it's not moving towards a pu more pure form because it can't get to that ultimate uh, direction. So we, again, it's not a kind of singular linear uh, project, uh, but it exists in all of these mongrel formations. So this means that the uneven development of neoliberalism, its uneven geographical development, is not a stage on the way to total neoliberalism. It's the only condition in which it can exist, is in a, an evenly developed form and with various mongrel formations with different social and state systems. We've also learned, as I mentioned earlier, that crises are regularly crucibles for the, for the reconstruction 
of the project. Firstly, systemically, the project was given birth to, if you like, as a state project in the crisis of Keynesianism. Uh, we've seen a whole series of conjunctural crises of neoliberalism itself in the period since, through which it's been remade. We can think of those being quite transnational, like the Asian financial crisis or the Wall Street crash, or specific, like Hurricane Katrina and, and municipal bankruptcies and so on. Um, each one of those are kind of petri dishes for the reconstruction of, of the, the project. <clears throat> Again, to re repeat this line, neoliberalism is never this complete uh, project, but is better understood, we would argue, as an ethos or a pattern of restructuring. Clearly, it doesn't, doesn't mean simply less state. We're not moving to a smaller state system. Um, the size of the states as a total share of GDP, as Milton Friedman moaned about until he went to his grave, uh, the states aren't, re states aren't really shrinking in a, in a straightforward manner. Uh, the American state might shrink in one area and grow in another. You've got a massive in increase in the prison system and a shrinkage in the welfare system. Uh, but the, like the, the size of the state uh, remains relatively stable. Um, so this is not a receipt for a small state future. Uh, it's a receipt for continued restructuring of the state it, with the image of the model of the small state as the guiding force. But we're not, clearly not going to a world of, uh, of tiny states because you restructure it in one area, it tends to kind of grow in another. Neoliberalism itself is associated with systemic uh, policy failure, but I've argued it tends to fail in, in a forward direction. It leads into, it anticipates and exploits crises of its own making. So workfare programs don't work. Um, they produce another problem, like work in poverty, for which there are then solutions, like earned income tax credits, which create other problems for which there must be. So this is how the project kind of tumbles forward endlessly into trying to find solutions for contradictions of its own uh, making. This is not a linear process. It's not about executing some template that was perfectly worked out in blueprint at Mont Pelerin. This is an experimental, exploratory kind of project. Privatization being a good example. You know, that did, wasn't handed down in tablets of stone from Mont Pelerin either, privatization. It kind of emerged conjuncturally, uh, particularly in the UK, as a strategy that worked for Thatcher with, confronted by a series of nationalized industries. Um, privatization wasn't the same kind of strategy, therefore, for Reagan, because he had almost no nationalized industries to privatize. But having been, if you like, birthed in the British context, privatization became a more generalized strategy, which then exists in all these other kinds of forms. So again, it's not this singular static project, but a, a series of, a, sort of experimental crisis-prone uh, modes of regulation. Uh, now stopped working. Okay, uh, okay, I'll just go uh, freestyle from here on. Uh, oh, there we are. There we are. So, uh, if it's not static, and quite a few people have mentioned uh, these mutations already, um, neoliberalism today isn't the same as neoliberalism in the past. You see these constant kind of shifts in its techniques and modes of governance and modes of misrepresentation and so on. I had a conversation earlier uh, about Thatcher's denial of society and Cameron's ev ev evocation as the, as the big society. You know, even if that is only smoke and mirrors in both cases, uh, the fact that these formulations travel along with notionally neoliberal projects, almost like the opposite of one another, suggests that yeah, this is not, again, a fixed phenomena. There's constant adaptation, constant reworking of the basic script and the basic series of strategies. So neoliberalization is, for me then, as to use Hayek's phrase, a flexible credo. Uh, one of the ways it would differ from 19th century liberalism, according to Hayek, was it had to be more adaptive to 20th century circumstances. It had to be, it couldn't be a fixed that's one, one of the reasons that von, von Mises was increasingly isolated from the rest of the guys at Mont Pelerin. Von, von Mises was this paleoliberal that wanted to reconstruct some 19th century version of laissez-faire. Hayek, Friedman, and others wanted to develop a 20th century version of that project. 
which was about working under 20th century circumstances, those circumstances included the need to roll back the Keynesian welfare state, amongst other things. So that didn't exist in the 19th century. And so that's meant that, that neoliberalism had got to be a different project to liberalism. So it had to be a flexible credo. It couldn't be a fixed belief system. Again, notwithstanding all of its misrepresentations. So that's why um, the formulation that I've used of rolling back and rolling out of the state being a kind of constant uh, feature of neoliberalization, I think remains the case. We could argue to extend the alliteration uh, to an absurdity that we might be going into a period of roiling uh, neoliberalization now where it's been buffeted ever more strongly by crises. Uh, but as somebody who's predicted the end of neoliberalism myself a couple of times, uh, I now tend to demure from that. Uh, it's not that I expect it to live forever, uh, but it's been essentially an article of faith for the left that the contradictions of neoliberalism would eventually bring the project down. We believe that solidly for 20 odd years. Clearly, we were wrong, at least at points in the past. Um, the, the puzzle is how it lives with its contradictions, not um, just expect them to bring it all down. So this is the end. Um, a picture of the uh, British summer there for you. Um, <laughs> I, I would argue that we need to recognize that neoliberalism is deeply entrenched at the same time as being necessarily incomplete and therefore always re-emergent. This goes back to Hall's definition of hegemony, that need to constantly work on it and reproduce it, uh, which takes a lot of labor and a lot of effort. It doesn't spontaneously reproduce itself. This is no natural order. I've suggested that the reason to use the uh, rather awkward language of neoliberalization rather than to refer to neoliberalism as a condition or a world in which we live or a shorthand for the zeitgeist one of the reasons to refer to an ization uh, version of that is to refer to its rolling, transformative character. Um, to see it as, an e as a strategy for restructuring state and society and economy, um, not as an as a image of the future. Uh, and so it still has enormous consequences as a restructuring project, as a series of transformative programs. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say the world's going to look like the road to serfdom eventually. I don't think that will be uh, the case. We could also say that in, in reflection on the 2008 crisis, that maybe um, neoliberalism won't end in the way that many of us thought it would, in some sort of systemic big bang. But when I used to be asked that question about, well, when will this end? Um, given I've been giving talks on this thing for 20 years, I always got that question. And I used to say, well, when, a, when there's a financial crisis that strikes at the very heart of the system, you know, like New York. <laughs> and so now we've had a horrible natural exper experiment in that very phenomenon. And lo and behold, it survived that. Lo and behold, we now see neoliberalization being re reproduced out of Beijing, for God's sake. Uh, as well as other capitals around the world. It's clearly polycentric. It's clearly embedded in multiple sites in all these different forms now. So therefore, it's not likely to be taken out in that big bang uh, explosion. But perhaps instead, uh, this eventually, the capacity to keep all the plates uh, spinning will be exhausted. Yeah, maybe neoliberalization will be just It'll just burn out eventually, or maybe it will be just gradually exceeded by the other social forms with which it still coexists, with which it hasn't entirely destroyed, and the new social forms which are being created in its wake, which are potential alternatives to it. So there's always other things going on than neoliberalization. It's never the only actor on the stage, and those other actors at different points in history and in different places will no doubt be able to take advantage of those circumstances. Um, it's not going to be easy historically, it seems to me, at least that's the experience so far. Um, but there's a, there's, I think there's a tactical lesson uh, in, in this uh, reading of neoliberalization as an incomplete project, coexisting with other things and never entirely uh, destroying its alternatives. So that's when we, we look at, um, if we look at the rather incoate nature of alternatives and resistance to neoliberalism, you know, at the moment we can... Yeah, a kind of geographical and scalar analysis of those would reveal something. Uh, many actually existing alternatives to neoliberalism um, uh, 
are quite local. Uh, the left is actually celebrating localism. Um, uh, that seems to me to be a strategic error of a grotesque proportion to console ourselves with running alternative coffee shops while leaving the right in control of the financial system is a, is a serious error. So uh, we shouldn't get into this nostalgic, this kind of localist trap um, because the left's localism, it seems to me, is a symptom of its weakness, not the key to its refound re strength. So alternatives tend to be local, Resistance tends to be seasonal. We tend to name resistance projects after seasons now. Uh, spring is the shortest of the seasons, uh, you may know. Um, so we have these flashpoints of resistance that often don't become more than the sum of their parts, uh, and we have localized alternatives. So that, it seems to me, is diagnostic of the problem of the left at the present time. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.